Welcome to the Big Bass Podcast. My name's Terry Battisti. And I'm Ken Duke, our producer, engineer, director, best boy, key grip, everything else is Nathan Benson. And today, folks, we've got a great show for you. It's called Orville Ball. If you don't know that name, you're about to know it in pretty considerable detail, because we're going to tell you the amazing story of how three friends got together fishing in California in the late 1950s and changed the bass fishing world forever. That's right, Ken. It was an incredible experiment that, that became a reality, uh, and it worked better than anybody could have ever imagined it would have. Uh, it's the story how Florida strain largemouth uh, went from an idea, a concept that was in the or in the heads of, of three guys as they're fishing on Lake Henshaw in Southern California, uh, you know, and it it literally changed the face of bass fishing forever. Um, but let's first talk about some of the history of, of big fish uh, through the course of time between 1900 and, and 1965, Ken. Yeah, you know, that was a very interesting time. And folks, if you don't know that Terry and I love telling this story, you don't know us because I'm a Florida guy. He's a West guy from California. So this is, this is the battle. This is the battle right here, the Florida the Florida bass that went to California, all of that. This is me versus Batiste right here. Yeah, yeah. It's but, like, uh, why couldn't Florida grow a, you know, a, a big fish, huh? I mean. Well, probably, probably because it was we do Georgia it that had the, it had Georgia that had the world record, right? Well, we're going to, we're going to talk about that another time. But uh, for now, let's talk about some of the older records. I think uh, a lot of the folks watching and listening know about George Perry's 1932 world record from Georgia that weighed 22 pounds, four ounces. Um, before that, though, in 1923, you've got a guy in Florida named Fritz Friebel who caught a 20-pound, two-ounce largemouth bass in central Florida. And and before Fritz Friebel, you've got H.W. Ross, who, who apparently caught, allegedly caught, probably caught a 23-pound, eight-ounce bass in central Florida way, way, way back in 1884 there's an, there are a few other fish that pop up from time to time if you do some research that that may have been gigantic that may have weighed 20 pounds or, or even more but but those are the ones that have the most gravitas to them and um and all that pretty much stayed static until these developments that that terry's going to teach us more about today yeah so essentially the story begins on Lake Henshaw, which is a, essentially an 800-acre lake in Southern California. Back in the 50s and, and 60s and even the early 70s, it was a phenomenal bass fishery. Um, of course, you still had the San Diego lakes. Uh, all of them existed since the 30s and 40s to provide San Diego drinking water. And uh, they weren't used for irrigation, but it was just drinking water for the people that lived in San Diego County. So... These three guys, Orville Ball, of course, is, is one of them that's, that's on the water. A uh, professional baseball uh, player by the name of Ray Boone was the second. And the third was a writer out of Southern California named Rolla Williams. And, and they're out on Henshaw. I believe they were actually fishing crappie. Uh, and because Ball was a, a fisheries biologist, Boone – who had been at spring training in Florida asked Ball, why aren't the fish in California as big as the fish in Florida? And Ball said something to the effect that they're a different strain. And Boone countered that with, well, why don't we put Florida fish in California? And that way we can catch bigger fish in California. And absolutely. And, and Terry, let me, if I might go ahead, out just yeah. real quickly, these were, these were San Diego guys. Mm -hmm. uh, Orville Ball was from that part of California. Yep. Ray Boone was from that part of California. And, and Rolla Williams, who was born in the East, had moved there many years earlier. So these guys were ingrained in, in California. And to your point about uh, Ray Boone and spring training, he was with the Detro Detroit Tigers at that time. He was a third baseman. And, uh, of course, every spring they'd go down where they still go, Lakeland, Florida, uh, and, and have spring training. And Ray Boone enjoyed – going fishing and would quite often catch some really good fish down here. Yeah. Yeah. So that conversation that they had that day stuck in, uh, in, in Ball's head. And so he decided that, that, you know, 
he was going to go and, and, and talk to some biologists uh, that were, you know, in charge of, you know, the fisheries area in San Diego. And what better place to go than the Scripps, Scripps Institute, uh, you know. And But prior to going to the Scripps Institute, what he does is he goes to probably the San Diego, UC San Diego or San Diego State, and he does a literature search to, to see if there's any written documentation that there's a difference between Florida fish and California fish. And sure enough, he finds uh, an article, I believe it was written in 1949, by a guy that we talked about last week by the name of Carl Hubbs, uh, uh, the leading taxonomist of largemouth or black bass at that time, uh, but not just bass. I mean, this guy actually named, I think it's, close to 50 different fish. And I mean, it's we're talking from little teeny darters to ocean fish that, that he actually got to name because he discovered them. And so when Ball finds out that, that it's Hubs and he knows that Hubs is at the Scripps Institute, in fact, he was running the Scripps Institute, he, he got all giddy and uh, went down to the Scripps Institute and, and sets this meeting with Hubs and, and Hubs says, Hell, yeah, that's a great idea. Why don't we bring these fish to California and we'll do this experiment? So, heck, he's got the leading taxonomist in the world backing him. So what's he going to do? He's going to go to the California Department of Fish and Game, and they're going to, you know, sign off on it. And uh, they're going to, you know, have these fish sent out to, to California. Well, that's not the way it happened. He met with was met with unbelievable uh, uh, people at the Department of Fish and Game that, that wanted nothing to do with this. Um, and so what did Ball do? Ball had people in high places. And so Ball did a flank and uh, went around him and got the governor uh, on his side. And the governor told the Department of Fish and Game that, yeah, we're essentially going to do this. And next thing you know, they've got the green light to go ahead. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's the, the crux of this. That's where this thing actually gains the steam. So now they've got to get a hold of a, a fish or a, a, a hatchery in Florida. So you want to add something? Well, Ken? I was going to ask you some questions because you're, you're much more familiar with the story than I am. Uh, there, there's a lot of, you'll hear a lot that, that Orville Ball was paying for these fish out of his own pocket. Uh, is there any truth to that? I mean, that's a rumor I've heard through the years. Yeah, I, you know, I honestly don't know. I don't know what the answer is. But at the With same all that time, support, it seems unlikely. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if if you have hubs involved in this at all, I guarantee that the Scripps Institute could have probably given some funding because they actually flew a San Diego plane out to uh, Pensacola. You know. Uh, to, to, to catch or to, to get these fish. The way the research co community works is that, you know, if you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. Hubs had an opportunity to test a theory out. Uh, and it means, and, and, and Scripps Institute's got a ton of money. Uh, and plus the San Diego Parks Department had a slush fund that they could, could use. So you know, the person that would know the answer to possibly would be to Jim Brown. And if we could get a hold of Jim Brown, that would be the first question that I'd ask. Him. So, excuse me. Well, but we're going to be talking to Jim. We're going to be talking to Jim on a number of other stories. So we'll have yeah. to touch base with him on that one. But, yeah. but what a bold thing Orville Ball did. Uh, that's the thing that impresses me most about the guy is he was willing to to make this this bold, big potentially somewhat expensive and dangerous effort. And of course, something like that could never happen today. No. You know, to, to use state or, or municipal money to bring in what is essentially an invasive species. Uh, that could never happen today. Yeah. Yeah. Especially I, in I, California. Well, and if you look at Texas, you know, the Texas uh, started bringing fish, Florida fish in, in the, late 70s, early 80s. I mean, it was essentially California was the, and not only that, you know, California brought in Alabama spots, which we'll be talking about later, you know, on some other show. 
uh, but but they brought in spots, and I believe that was in the late seventies or mid seventies. Um, you know, they transferred a bunch of different smallmouth species. Tennessee brought in Floridas back in the oh golly, I want to say that was the eighties. You know, so you've got all this happening between 1959 and the, the mid to late 80s with all this bucket biology going on. But today, there's no way in hell because, like, exactly what you say, the invasive species deal, you know. So. And, and Orville Ball was, was not just the first guy to do it, but he was very much the test case. I think if Orville Ball and, and that San Diego effort had not been so wildly successful – well, uh, you wouldn't have seen it happening everywhere else. Yeah, the, the first people to do this, they predate uh, Henshaw. You know, Henshaw did this all the time. You know, he was yeah. putting putting whiskey barrels full of fish and sending them to, to you know, out west. I mean, well, it was... That, that, it was, was, that was Spencer Baird doing that. But. Well, that, and that, that's the stuff that predated Henshaw, right? In the 1820s yeah. and 1830s. Because well, they... They needed a fish to feed 50, the people 60, that were up there in the Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, that's this all all this experiment with you know moving fish around and stuff like that. I mean, that that there's a long history of that happening, um, and that's why you have essentially largemouth bass west of the Mississippi because they didn't exist. Prior Absolutely. To that. Yeah. Same with the smallmouth. With bucket biology. Yeah. On a large scale. Barrel biology. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> barrel, yeah. Barrel biology. That's right. <laughs> so anyway, so they they've got all the the T's crossed and I's dotted, the whole nine yards. Now they've got the support that they need and they need to find these fish. So essentially what they do is they, they go to the Florida State Fish Hatchery in Holt, Florida which is near Pensacola, I understand. Uh, and they order these fish, um, 30,000 of them, uh, to be shipped in two shipments. Uh, they fly the plane uh, out to Florida. And actually, prior to this going on, they needed a place to put these fingerlings uh, that had, I mean, that was essentially a barren lake, no fish in it. So what they did is there's a lake called Upper Otai in San Diego, and it is the lake uh, that is above Lower Otai, hence the Upper and Lower Otais. S slow down now, slow down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they they wrote known Upper Otai, and wrote known is a uh, an herbicide uh, that actually has a adverse effect on fish, essentially kills everything. Uh, they, it takes the oxygen out of the water. Right. They they killed all the fish in uh, Upper Otai. They did discover that there was a few bullheads that survived, but that wasn't going to affect the bass uh, population. Um, and so they first shipment of uh, of Florida strain largemouth comes out to uh, California, and they get quarantined. And while they're in quarantine. Uh, the biologists discovered that they have a, a skin or a slime coat disease called ick. And it's essentially a bacterial fungus type of thing. Uh, and so they killed all 10,000 of those. They didn't even try to see if they would make it uh, because they didn't want these fish with ick going into upper Otai and, you know, spreading that bacteria. Right. So uh, next shipments, 20,400 fingerlings and they get to san diego uh they go through quarantine they make it they're healthy and they get dumped into upper otai uh in 1959 and now they have these fingerlings you know they're they're putting uh bait fish i assume they put shad in there uh to be a forage and they let these fish stew for a few years and Roughly in 1965 is when they started transplanting those fish into San Vicente, El Capitan, Sutherland, Lake Wolford, and uh, what was the other one? Um, goodness, Sutherland, uh, Hodges. Oh, and Lake Murray. Um, Murray, yeah. Yeah. And the interesting thing. And of course, I, those are... Those those lake names are the ones that are going to become, or some of the ones that are going to become legendary 
uh, by the mid 1970s as they start to turn out. Absolutely, except, except for right. Hodges, because they did not ever open Hodges up. Hodges stayed closed for all that time, and they did not open Hodges up until I want to say 1983 or 1982. All right. And of course, Hodges was all also trout trout free. Exactly. It was a trout free lake. There was no trout in that lake at all. Uh, the problem with Hodges, one of the deals was, is that the, the from what I understand, there was dam problems, uh, but there was also uh, difficulty getting water into that lake. So that lake would fluctuate a heck of a lot, uh, you know, throughout the years. Uh, and, and the year that they actually opened it up was after our 1982, 1983 torrential rains that we had had. We had had a drought forever. Every seven years, California goes through a drought. And uh, that year we got like 36 or 40 inches of rain, which is four or five times more than the average. And it filled Hodges up and it opened and it was the first time that it had ever been fished publicly. Um, it had been poached many times. Um, and uh, I mean, it was just amazing. Uh, the fish, the fish. Anyway, I'm getting off track. So anyway, um, yeah, so they, they, they put these fish in. And then by 1968, you've got Orville Ball. Uh, I mean, they're, they're watching these fish coming out of, you know, and they're, you know, 65, they're put in, and 66 and 67, they're catching, you know, six pounders, seven pounders, eight pounders, nine pounders. The California state record at the time is 14 even out of Round Lake in Northern California. Uh, and the San Diego County record was only 10 pounds. And I mean, they're touching, touching, touching that, that, that record and, and not getting it. And then in, what is it? 67 by, by 67, they've broken the San Diego city, uh, or County, uh, record 23 times between 65 in 1968, it had been broken 23 times, maybe 28. That's crazy. Go ahead. I'm going to tap into your. I'm going to tap into your knowledge, not as a historian here, but as an angler. Obviously, there were some fish that they could have caught a fair amount earlier that would have broken some of those records. Do you think at that point in the mid 60s that they just didn't quite know how to target these Florida bass that have been transplanted? And that's a weird question, maybe, but okay. I'm so here's about that. so so growing up down there, there were two lakes that that did not have Floridas in them. When I was a kid in the mid seventies and you know through the the mid eighties, it was Lake Piru and it was Kachuma, and those lakes had pure strain northern bass in them in Southern California. And we loved to go there because the fish were so much easier to catch. I mean, it was <laughs> ridiculous. The difference between the catchability, and Botroff even talks about this uh, in, in a lot of the, the, the those early papers, is that, yeah, the anglers are going to have to learn how to adapt to catch these Florida strain fish. And that was the problem, is that, you know, these guys are fishing 15 and 20-pound line that they were used to throwing a big jig for these bass and these Floridas were not going to eat it because they could see the cable going down to the freaking jig, you know, I mean, I'm talking, yeah, the water's gin clear in a lot of those, yeah, I mean, you, those, uh, you could lakes. read, a, you could read a Coors can in 30 foot of water in most of these reservoirs. So that's pretty clear. And, and so they're going out with heavy line and, and, and stuff like that. And they're just having a hell of a time catching fish. And then you get groups of guys like the guys that belong to the Pisces Club, which was Bill Murphy, Jim Patton, uh, Bobby Sandberg, Mike Folkstad. Um, I mean, real big studs that they were on them. Those guys were catching the fish, and they wouldn't tell anybody except their little inner circle what they were doing. And in a lot of cases, they were fishing light line, 8-pound, 10-pound line. Um, 12 pound line maximum for, you know, any of these fish. And, and that's how they started, you know, catching these 
big giant Floridas. That or they were fish and bait. I mean, there was crawdads were legal, shiners were legal, and uh, water dogs were legal. So a lot of these guys were legally fishing bait and, and catching big fish doing that. So, you know, you have the record, state record being broken 23, 25, 28 times between 66 and 68. And uh, now you have Ball saying, okay, we're, we're going to break the 14-pound the mark um, set in 1948. And, uh, you know, we're going to do that this year. This is 1968. And uh, what happens? So you have 1969 comes, 68 comes around. They, they net a fish that was uh, 15 pounds. Uh, 14, 15 from under a dock uh, at Lake Wolford. Uh, and, you know, at that point, they're going, balls just frothing at the mouth, thinking, oh, this is going to happen this year. It's going to happen. <laughs> and in, in 68, it, it, it didn't happen in 68, uh, which surprised everybody. Um, so in, in, in 69, you're saying, oh, yeah, this is going to be the year that does it. But let's look at some of the fish that were caught in in so 68 it was a 14 15 uh john a guy named by the name of john Folzelman uh catches a fish uh out of lower otai that weighed 15 1 but it did not become the state record because it was caught prior to the opener of otai at a writer's gig now imagine being invited to that all right, you got a lake that's been closed yeah, sign for, me up. for six months, and it's got all these big flipping fish in it, and you get invited to go down there, and you get a fifteen-one, and it eclipses the old record, yeah, you know, the California record by a pound one ounce, and you don't get to claim that as the California record because it was caught on a writer's junket. That would suck. <laughs> yeah, that's so, horrible. So, but, you know, I mean, it's still got documented and, and, and balls there. And, and by this time, he's got Jim Brown working for him. Um, and uh, all, all is good. So now we have 1969. Again, at the pre-March 5th opener, they get a 13-8. They get a 13-6. They get a 14-1 and a 15-even. And none of them count. <laughs> so you got another. How's that? Yeah. Well, again, it's another writer's junket. You know, I mean, it's it. it, <laughs> it, it I've, it's been, I've been to some good writer's junkets, but none of them have been nearly that good, Terry. I know. I, yeah. And and every it's like every year. So it, it was uh, kind of a bummer. You know, what are, what are you going to do? So and uh, then they got a 16 one. And I mean. That's that's two pounds over, and of course that obliterates again, the record. Yeah, obliterates. Uh, but but that fish wasn't caught. It was actually scooped up. Uh, it was found dead, uh, and it was found by the parks uh, management floating prior to the writer's junket. So they now know that they have a sixteen one, which they actually said should have been closer to 17 and a half pounds, but it had dehydrated after dying. So you got some big fish. You got some real big fish that are happening. And then um, you, you, you get a, there was a 12 in the mix. There was another 16 in the mix. Uh, just going through my notes here. I mean, uh, you then you had a, another 17 pounder that was, that was scooped up. Um, this time at Lower Otai. So Otai had one, two, three, four, five, six teeners, all over 13 and a half pounds. You have. So uh, what is the, what is the growth rate of these fish? These fish have got to be pound and a half, two pounds a year. Almost. It's, it's nearly two pounds a year, nearly two pounds That's a year. Stunning. What, and what they're finding That's is that, that some of these fish aren't from, uh, the actual fingerlings that were put into upper otai. Some of these fish are actually second and third generation fish uh, that had been, you know, either spawned in upper otai 
uh, and used to transplant or had actually spawned in the lakes that they were put in. So, but a lot, these fish are, the fish that are reaching these, these highest weights, they're probably still pure Floridas. Uh, they're, I, they're probably I, not, not a lot of intergrades in there. Not a lot of F ones. Absolutely. You know, at, at this point in time, you're, you're, you're right. Because there's no way, let's say you put a, a gen, a gen one or a gen zero fish from Otai that, you know, had reached six pounds into one of the lakes and it did breed with, a, with a Northern, um, you know, female or male, that fish wouldn't have had time to get up to that teen class. So there's no way in hell right. that, that, right. and I think that's the point you're trying to make. There's no way that these are actual F1s. These are, these are pure Florida strain fish. So well, another point I'm trying to make here, Terry, is that, that California is not that great. These are still Florida fish. These are still my boys, my <laughs> but girls. I, but then I throw it right back. Weights. I throw it right back at you is why can't Florida, you know, create a fish that can, can push the record. I mean, you know, it's... Oh, the shame, the shame of it all. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they, it was a great experiment. So anyway, March of 1969, uh, a guy by the name of Jerry Kuhn's fishing the El Capitan. He catches a 12-13 uh, on a water dog uh, out of, out of uh, El, El Capitan Lake. And then this is where the funny shit, you know, excuse me, starts happening. April 5th, 1969, a guy by the name of David Jake Jacobs catches a 15 pound, four ounce fish and it becomes the state record. So it's finally the one that is considered the state record because the 15 one that was caught in 68 was caught at a writer's junket. This fish was caught while the lake was open for its season. And guess what they caught it on, Ken? And, and that's Miramar, right? That's that was Miramar. at Lake Miramar, yes. Guess what they caught it on? Um, I. I... You've told me this, and I don't want to repeat it because I don't want to denigrate our favorite genus of fish, the Micropterus genus. But go ahead and say the word cheese. It'll, people will think it was a, yeah, cheese. It was no. caught on a cheese ball. So now, this really makes you think. The guy was trout fishing. He had a size 16 treble hook. He was fishing with a cheese ball on six pound line. Size 16. I don't think I could thread the eye of the hook of a size 16 hook. It's so small. I don't You'd have to think get your monocle out. <laughs> oh, I would. I would need every magnifying device I had. <laughs> Scanning size electron 16. microscope. Yeah, a size 16 That's... treble and a piece of cheese. So uh, did the guy catch it on a cheese ball or did he catch a trout that ended up getting eaten by the she, by, by a bass. That's now you're that's, talking. Now we can save the dignity of that 15 pounder. Yeah. And, and, and you're going to see, as I start listing off some of these fish that, uh, it becomes real evident really fast that these fish are getting big because they're eat, eating trout. It's, uh, it, or as some folks out in California, your former stomping grounds call it vitamin T. Vitamin T, exactly. Yep. You know, they used to stock them uh, in the lakes uh, because they they were cheaper. But they, they used to call them threes, which stood for three to a pound. Uh, so you have three trout that make up a pound. They're about eight inches long and uh, resemble a swimming candy bar. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's ex <laughs> that's good. I like that. <laughs> so you've, They're you've nature's chocolate, exactly. And uh, so this guy catches a fifteen four on cheese, and it becomes a state record. And then we have to now go to nineteen seventy, and this and one of my favorite stories, by the way. Go of for a it, Ken. giant fish caught. Go no, for no, no, no. I, I can't do it justice the way you can. But uh, this is a story we're going to tackle uh, sometime in the future, folks. This is just a this is just a cool story that uh, everybody needs to know about. And and for that, I leave it to Dr. Batisti. Yeah. Anyway, so you know, and, and these fish that I've rattled off that that were caught in '69. I mean, these are just the fish that are over, you know, 12, 13, 14 pounds. I mean. 
there were other fish that did not make the paper because by now you're if you bring a 10 to the freaking dock nobody cares because there's 10 11 pound fish getting caught every week and mind you this lake's only open three days a week uh and they they, they staggered them it was you know el cap might have been open tuesday saturday and sunday otai was open wednesday saturday and sunday sunday you know, Samba City, maybe Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and and that's the way they ran those lakes. So now we come to February 7th, 1970. It's a week before the opener, and a college student who is actually a fisheries biology major by the name of John Halby goes to Lake Otai and decides that because his classes start the following week, he isn't going to be able to make the opener, but he wants to fish it. So he jumps the fence, uh, throws out a black plastic worm, gets bit, and sets the hook into a big fish. It's big. And he takes it back home with him, puts it on a scale, Realizes that this fish is a 16 pound class fish. He's remember he's a fisheries biologist. New state major. record. New it's state a new, record. it's a new state record, and he can't a talk about it. He can't give the lake any credit. You know, and you know that's. I mean, he was a biologist. Go ahead. And not just a new state record, folks. But think about this. This is 1970. The only states that have produced a fish this size would be Georgia, allegedly, and Florida. Yeah. No other states yeah. have done it. No. It, Mississippi it, didn't have a giant record then. I uh, think Tennessee, had, have, Tennessee had a pretty good record well, at that, that point. South right? Carolina had a 16-2 from the late 40s. I, I did forget that fish, 16-2. Yeah. But, but for the most part, uh, the state records were not nearly what they are today. And, no. and again, I'm going to say that it's the reason they are what they are today is because of Florida bass, doctor. But go ahead with your Halby story because I absolutely love this story. Yeah. So Halby gets home, realizes how big the fish is because he's a fisheries biologist. He's got a conscience. Well, I won't say all fisheries biologists have consciences, but this guy has a conscience. And and what does he do? He puts the fish in a burlap bag. He drives back to to Lower Otai, or yeah, Lower Otai puts the burlap bag at the corner of the driveway to the, the gatekeeper for, for Lower Oats High, jams a note in its mouth, goes back to his house and anonymously calls the gatekeeper at midnight and says, hey, uh, if you look at the end of your driveway, you're going to find a big bass, you know, and he hangs the phone up. And so... What, is, what does the gatekeeper do? He goes out to his driveway, just like the guy said, there's a burlap sack with a big bass in it with a note stuck in its face. And essentially the note said, you know, I, I caught this fish today. I know I caught it illegally. Uh, you know, it, 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 it was such a burden on, on my, my soul that, that you know, I, I, I wasn't going to be able to give the fish credit and, and lower oats, I wasn't going to get any credit. And, uh, you know, therefore... I'm returning it, and hopefully you guys can give the fish some credit and give the lake some credit. And boom. And, and of course, he was worried about his own future. Oh yeah, you got to just that. That's definitely in his calculus too. <laughs> but the funny, the, the funny what, thing, the funny what poaching th might do to him. Yeah, yeah. So, but the the really funny thing is, is that uh, Orville Ball. And uh, Jim Brown, and at this point, Larry Botroff's now working, and they put out a press release that a 15-pound, seven-and-three-quarter ounce bass had been poached at Lower Otai. And within 24 hours, they have, like, dozens of phone calls from people saying that they're the ones that caught it. <laughs> That's one of my favorite parts of the story, Terry. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite parts. Because whenever... Whenever a giant bass, I mean a truly giant bass, you know, world-class bass quite often, pops up, even if it involves some heinous act to catch it, you know, yeah. 
people are will line up to claim that fish. I, and, and that's exactly what happened there for Lower Otai. They will line yeah. up. Yep. Yeah, I'm a I'm a poacher. Lock me up. But yeah. I caught the 15, 7 and 3 quarters. Yeah. So shocking. You know, all this crap's literally going down in the in the newspapers for the next week and a half. And finally, it it gets to to John Halby. And Halby calls San Diego Parks, says he's the guy that does it. Um, he, and by the way, he caught it on a black plastic worm, if I didn't mention that before. And, and it was a technique that the, one of the reasons he was getting out there that I've read, Terry, one of the reasons he wanted to get out there on lower Otai early was because, not because he thought he'd catch a giant bass, but because he had been reading about plastic worm techniques and he wanted to, to check them out for himself. He was just a very avid angler. Yeah, that's exactly what he was doing. He wanted to check out a new worm fishing technique that he had read somewhere. And where did he read it? I have no idea. Um, he could be referring to something that was in Bassmaster or, you know, could, or the paper. Field and stream, outdoor Field and stream, life. Yeah, who knows? Anywhere. You know? And um, so they have him come down. Uh, at, when he gets there, the uh, San Diego PD's there. They have a handwriting expert, and they have Halby scribble some notes down on a piece of paper. The handwriting expert looks at it and says, that's our man. So, uh, because so he, he the cups off and he's, he's still in prison, am I right? <laughs> no, no. So, Orville Ball finds out that he wants to be a fisheries biologist. You know, he did the right thing. He turned the fish in. You know, he could obviously tell that the kid had, and this kid, he was like 22 years old. He could tell that there was a lot of remorse, and so he didn't press charges. Well, as soon as Ball doesn't press charges... That makes it okay for this fish to be considered to be a state record because there were no violations. You know, the the fact that you can't fish the San Diego lakes when they're closed is a city ordinance. It is yeah, not municipal ordinance. It is not a state law. And he was he caught the, the impact of state law. He caught the fish during the day, which was in California, they've got some weird flipping rules. In Southern California, it's illegal to fish at night. At least it was back then, and I think it might still be. Um, it's Northern California, you can fish at night. But in Southern California, you can't. And so the fish was caught during the day. Uh, the fish was caught. He had a fishing license, so he didn't break that rule. And the California Department of Fish and Game said, yeah, it could be considered. Now, I don't think it – I can't find anywhere whether or not that fish was actually considered the record. But it, 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 it was, you know, there's, there's no doubt in anybody's mind that at the time that it beat the cheese fish from Jake Jacobs by <laughs> cheese fish <laughs> by three and three quarter ounces, you know, which is actually, uh, that's good enough for the IGFA, right? I mean, it's going to be two and a half ounces for IGFA for a fish two under 25 ounces. For pounds. IGFA, yeah. 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 Two ounces. So that was the. I mean, that was the only big fish, you know, when I'm saying big, nothing over 14, that I could find anywhere documented uh, that, that came in 1970. Now, there was a bunch of 10s, 11s, and 12s. But they keep coming. They keep, yeah. yeah I, I mean. But the giants keep coming. The, the giants keep coming. So let's uh, move on to 1971. We got Lower Otai, February 10th. A 14.7. We have uh, January 17th, Randall Danio out of Lake Miramar catches a 16.11. Guess what he caught this fish on? Uh, cheese? No, he caught it on an Abu Reflex spoon. And for you Abu freaks that remember back in those very, days. Very traditional bass lure. <laughs> it's a trout spoon. You know, it's 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 like a, a, a cast master or a super duper. You know, it's a, a concave spoon you throw out. It wobbles yeah, back and twists your line like a machine. Exactly. And it might have a, a size 10 or a size 8 treble on the back of it. Well, again, I mean, instantly, being bass fisherman, that fish was probably caught on the trout that he hooked. And that bass, you know, grabbed a hold of that trout and either got hooked by the hook as the trout came off the hook. 
or that bass just flat wouldn't let go of it and it got boated. I'm I'm sure there were a lot of guys uh, who uh, caught trout on a five aught hook and and took a long time fighting them. Yeah, that's another story that we're going to be telling. I mean, there's so many fish in, that that are have. There were a lot of people down there in the 70s and early 80s before the swim bait craze that got caught fishing live trout. Guys that would get caught, you know, before they launched their boat in their live well, they've got, you know, a dozen or two dozen trout that they got at Happy Jack's fish farm. And that was a, that was one of the fish hatcheries in Southern California, Happy Jack's. Uh, and... These guys would go there and they'd buy, you know, trout, put them in the live well and, and boom, you know, or they would go out there and they would catch trout with trout gear and they would put those on the live well and use them for bait. There was a lot of, of fish that, that were caught illegally. And for those that you don't know, it's illegal to use a sport fish in California I, for bait. Trout are considered yeah. sport fish. It's so. illegal in most states, actually, to use a game fish to catch another game fish. Yeah. Um, and, and, of course, uh, in California, where they were knocking on state records, that, that door almost every day for yeah. years, the temptation had to be tremendous. Yep. Yeah, so you've got a 1611. Now it's the state record. It's the second state record in a row that that has been caught by a trout fisherman, which is just – crazy and that that ends out 1971 you know and of course again i mean there's been a lot of now it's they're not paying attention to to 12 and 13 pounders that's you know whatever the the new mark is that's all the 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 papers want to report i mean you can read in the in the fish reports in in all the 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 county newspapers uh dating back all the way back then that you know and, and Joe got a 10 pounder and Mark got an 11 pounder. And I mean, it was just like, you know, blow, blowing those fish off, but they're still huge fish. Now those, at this point, 1971, 72, 73, those 10 and 11 pounders, they could be F1s at that point. Absolutely. They could be sure. You yeah. Know, but because the, the odds of two pure Florida's mating. In a lake that's full of northerns. Unlikely. Yeah. Because these yeah. lakes were full of northerns. And, and so now you've got, you know, these, let's just say eight to, to 10 pounders that highly possible that they were, that they were F1s. But these 10 plus fish, they're, they're six, seven, eight years old. So when you go back to that period, it becomes a little more likely that they're pure Floridas. But yeah, as time goes by, yeah. the odds of a pure Florida are, are, more, are growing more and more remote. Right. And, but you know, you're talking about these these mid-teen fish. Those are probably still pure strain Florida bass. So, and more and more California lakes are coming online with Florida bass. You know, the yeah. success stories in San Diego. Uh, Ball was just expanding that universe of oh, lakes yeah. with Florida bass. Yeah. So, so it was 1960, so 1968. A, they they put fish Florida fish in Casitas. 1968. And, they drove yeah. them. Casitas. Castaic. Clearly. Uh, those are going to become, yeah, those are going to become a couple of the most famed trophy giant bass lakes in, in world history. Maybe the two most famed, Castaic yeah. and Casitas. And we're, and we're going to talk about the, the life of those two lakes, which is, to me, is probably the saddest trophy fish story uh, there is. Uh, because those lakes, in their heyday, there, there was nothing that could top them. Nothing. Even the San Diego lakes, you know, Dixon and stuff. Yeah, those lakes produced Dottie, right? Um, you know, but but Casitas and Castaic, if what happened to them did not happen, I, I won't say I guarantee, but it was highly likely that you were going to see a world record come out of either Castaic or Casitas. So certainly a real um, chance, you know, Dixon with Dottie, that's one fish. And that's one fish. And Dixon never produced life. another fish. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's it a never 60... produced another fish, anything remotely like that. Yeah. So they also put uh, Florida's in Clear Lake, which is all the way in Northern California in 1968. So uh, 
I mean, Ball was so like what you're you said, saying is that. Go ahead. Oh, Ball was the father of of world class bass fishing. Oh, there is no argument there. You know, I mean, I, it, it, yeah, it's well. Actually, I hate to say I, that about I was, a guy from San Diego. But there it is. <laughs> I would I would actually credit Boone because it was Boone that planted the seed in Ball's <laughs> head. All right. Okay. All right. A pretty good third baseman. And uh, hey, the father of Bob Boone, the great catcher from the 70s and 80s, the grandfather of Aaron and Brett Boone. Mm. So uh, arguably the, the one of the great one of the greatest families in, in Major League Baseball history. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and to think to think that if the Cactus League had existed back in the 1950s and yeah. guys would be going to spring training in Arizona instead of Florida. Yeah. None of this might ever have happened. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Absolutely. We have, we have so, the, uh, we have Florida. Every little butterfly, butterfly stroke of the wings <laughs> has impact folks impact. Exactly. Absolutely. So, uh, but, but you've got another bigger story in 72. Yeah. Another story in 72. Uh, so let's start out in April. A guy named Leighton Gillette, fishing Lake Wolford, gets a 15-15. Okay, it's not 16-11. Eh, you're just but creeping them up there. Creeping this is, up a, there. Big this fish, is another big fish. big fish. This is the, the lake record for Lake Wolford at the time. And again, what was it caught on, Ken? Uh, if you say cheese, I'm going to start building. It was caught on cheese. Designed to look like Swiss cheese. It was caught on cheese. So now you've got all these trout fishermen flocking to the lake, thinking that they're going to, you know. And I'm dead serious. Uh, I remember this when I was a kid. You know, going to Wolford and you know going to Miramar and fishing from shore at times because we didn't have a boat at that point. And, you know, sometimes we'd fish from shore and sometimes we'd rent a boat. And being on the shore and all these trout fishermen would call themselves bass fishermen because they're throwing cheese. <laughs> I mean, it was it was hilarious. Uh, yeah. And, and but oh, I, mean, I never imagined that. Yeah. But I was like eight years old at this at this point in time. And I believed it because, you know, Hell, the bass are eating cheese because you're reading about it in Western Outdoor News every flipping week. So and so got a seven pounder on cheese, and, you know. So anyway, you, you got a fifteen fifteen that sets the, the the lake record for Wolford. Was there a particular kind of cheese? Was it? I like Swiss. A big At the Swiss time, fan. it was it was Zeke's floating bait, primarily. So you know, it's a floating. It's a, wow. Yeah. So it's a cheese that's a top water bite. Well, what they would do is they would, you know, put a four or six foot leader, uh, and, yeah, it float, and it would float and it would float off up. the bottom. Yeah, and uh, you know, you'd hook a trout, and then all of a sudden you've put the thing in free spool and <laughs> let the trout swim out there for a little while. And next thing you know, you've got a sixteen pound bass. <laughs> amazing, uh, yeah, just amazing. So that happened in April of seventy two, and now you come up to July twenty sixth, nineteen seventy two. And a gentleman by the name of James Bates, fishing out of Lake Murray, sticks a seventeen fourteen. It's a big jump from sixteen eleven. It's a big 16, jump. Sixteen eleven, yeah. I mean, that's you know, pound uh, pound three ounces. Uh, guess what he caught it on? Oh, uh, well, I know it wasn't cheese. <laughs> you got that one on a purple, and somebody... purple plastic worm. <laughs> so finally, finally, we get the claim. A bass fisherman gets to claim. A record, and it just so happens that it's not just the Lake Murray Lake record; it is the state record for California. And uh, finally, a respectably caught California lunker. Exactly. Finally. Exactly. And it, but but all that's going to change with the next state record. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, that is in more ways than one. You know. Uh, so now. Uh, Again, you, you, you've got a 15 and a 17 caught in 72. Again, now guys are bringing in 12 and 13 pounders. They get honorable mention. If that, you know, maybe they're going to make the paper, probably aren't going to make the paper. You know, if it was the biggest fish that week and it was a 14 pounder, yeah, it's going to make the paper. But the, the 8 or 10 or 12 10 pounders that got caught do not make the paper. I mean, that's how crazy it, it, it got during this time. 
It was nuts. Well, I'll tell you another thing that, that blows me away. And this is a silly aside, maybe, Terry, but I'll, I would like to get your take on it. You know, Bates caught his state record 1714 in July, late July at that. If you look at the historical records of the, the biggest bass ever caught, almost without exception, they come between January 1 and early, early June. Okay. Yeah. They're not caught after that. They're simply not caught after that. The one exception I can think of is Anthony Denny's Mississippi state record, which was caught on December 31. So I'm almost which, not going to count that as an to me, To me, that makes sense because to me, uh, December in Mississippi would be like February or March possibly in California. Absolutely could be. But uh, but anyway, to see Bates catch that fish in in late July is seems kind of like an outlier to me. It's kind of weird. Um, I, I need to go back and do a, a deep dive on some of the dates of all these California lunkers from that era. Uh, maybe it was a combination of, of fishing pressure being so intense on them because of the excitement or whatever. But but most of these fish, uh, even Zimmerly, who we're going to talk about later and in, also in another episode his fish is a late june fish yeah. so very unusual for the giants very unusual yeah when, when you're talking well i think what you're going to find when you look at the california fish is that like florida their spawning season is all over the map i mean it's stretched out yeah. it's stretched out depending upon weather uh the other thing is is that uh sight fishing in california uh although you can catch fish in five foot or less of water you're more apt to catch the big ones in 10 foot to 15 foot of water. And so your, your, your spawning season there can, can range quite differently because for the water depth or for that water to warm up to a spawning temperature in 10 to 15 foot of water is going to put those bigger fish spawning later in the year or later. Makes later. a lot of sense. So, and, and I think what you're going to find when you do that, deep dive on dates that you're going to see that most of these big fish were caught in the March to June, July timeframe. I'll say another thing about it too, though. I'm guessing, and this is not a shot at anybody, but I'm guessing that those California anglers who were catching these giant fish back in the early seventies, they really weren't dialed in the way the California anglers became dialed in 15, oh. 18, 25 years later. No, and, you know, you had people like Lunker Bill Murphy, for example, who, I mean, he held his cards, and, and, and again, he was part of the Pisces Club. Uh, they held their cards close big time. I mean, talk to Folkstad sometime about those early days, because Folkstad started fishing with Pisces when he was like 17, 18 years old. Um, and to be a part of Pisces, you had to be invited, and they did not allow – any Joe Blow to join the club. You had to be invited by a fellow member to go to a meeting, fish two or three tournaments. Uh, then they put you up for a vote. Uh, and if you got if you got one black ball, you didn't make the club. You didn't make the club. And, you know, because they wanted to see if you were going to fit in. I mean, it, well, I won't get into what I do for a living, but, you know, I've always told uh, people that the – the best intelligence agents would be bass fishermen, uh, because <laughs> because they don't they don't freaking talk, um, and uh, and there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, back in those days, you you couldn't get information out of anybody. That and that was one of the advantages I had working at the tackle store. They had to buy their tackle somewhere. There was no Bass Pro Shops catalog. Uh, there was, I mean, there wasn't 74, but it, you know, it really didn't get popular until the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, there was no online purchasing. So you had to go somewhere to buy your fishing tackle. And that's what gave me a leg up on learning a lot of stuff. Even if they wouldn't tell me what they were doing, at least I knew what, the, what they were buying. And, you know, back then it was a lot of six to nine inch to long worms. Um, it was a lot of crawdads. It was a lot of water dogs. Um, it was a lot of big jigs. Um, 
and a lot of light line. I mean, most of these guys, when they were out there fishing uh, for these big fish, 10 pound line was considered heavy. Most of them are throwing eight. You know, you, you, you read, you read Murphy's book and, you know, he talks about stitching a worm and, and most of the time he's, he swears upon, you know, eight pound line. Uh, if the fishing's real tough, go to six. And if it's off the hook, you go to 10, maybe 12 at the max. I mean, you, you, you I mean, and we're throwing spinner baits with 12 pound and 10 pound. I'm, I mean, I was throwing crank baits with six and eight pound uh, when I was growing up. I mean, it was, it was crazy. These are the days before fluorocarbon, before some of the modern technology advances in, in yeah. filament even. Yeah. You know, there was, the, the mono was, I mean, the mono that you used was either Garcia Bonnell, uh, which was like piano wire, but I mean, 10 pound line had the diameter of a standard six pound test. Um, and then, and then you would use green maxima. That's what most everybody used was green maxima back then. Um, because it was just tough, good line. And that's what I have, you know, I mean, I have, you know, used, you know, maxima f forever. So I think he's still do using it, but, uh, anyway, so we get to 1973 and a guy named Terry Bernardo, uh, is fishing Lake Miramar in, in, in March. And he brings a 1710 to the dock, four ounces off the state record. And that's got Oroville ball by this time. He's, he's resigned. He, he resigned in night, August of 1970, but now you've got Botroff and you've got uh, a guy named Trembley that is the interim uh, for Ball's position. Jim Brown would end up taking it in 74. Um, and I mean, everybody's beating the drum. You know, California is going to pop the 20 pound mark. You know, George Perry's record is in, in, in danger of getting broken. Uh, and it's going to happen here at this county of the great experiment. And I mean, it was. It was crazy. Now, now they're looking at 13 pounders going, yeah, uh, <laughs> it's just another fish. You know? <laughs> turn, turn that one loose. Yeah, exactly. Catch it a couple of years. It was nuts. You know, um, I, I'll tell you one thing, you know, Lions and O'Haver, uh, who is a, a world renowned taxidermist because of what happened at this, during this time is a result of why so many taxidermists throughout the United States have molds for 10 pound, 11 pound, 12 pound, 13 pound, all the way up to, to 20 pound fish. They have molds that taxidermists can buy for just about any length to girth ratio that you catch in like quarter inch increments. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy, but I mean, the sampling of fish that they got to, to make molds out of was just staggering from the, the early seventies through the, the, the late eighties, because even in the late eighties guys were, you know, killing their fish and, and, you know, sending them to the, the taxidermists to get mounted. So, you know, again, you've got, you've got the 1710, you know, people are going nuts and then it kind of dies down uh, in, in May and June until the 23rd of June, 1973, and a guy by the name of We don't of want Dave's... to give away too much here. No, I won't. Yeah, we I can't won't. give away too yeah. much. guy named <clears throat> Dave Zimmerly, <laughs> who I believe was, uh, is he an electrician or something to do with construction, I believe. Is that, is that right, Ken? Yeah, I think I, that's right. I think I, it... Wasn't he fresh out of the Navy or something? Fresh out too? of the military. I think it might have been the Navy or the Air Force. Uh, he had just gotten done with an eight-year stint in uh, Missouri. Uh, or Kansas. Yeah. Um, hey, folks, when we when we say we don't know, that we don't know in this episode, I guarantee you by the time that episode rolls around. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll know. We'll be we'll, dialed in. We'll have his fingerprints. Um, and uh, so he gets out of the military. He moves back down to San Diego. And he had taken up bass fishing in, in the Missouri area while he was there. Supposedly had caught a 12-pound fish while he was in Missouri. That's a big fish for Missouri. But back then... They existed. Huge fish for Missouri. 
But but you, t- you talk that's, to you talk to Blockett, you know, and Blockett was fishing with his dad back in the, those days, and you know he said that you know ten pound largemouth at a table rock at that time of year or that time of you know the in the seventies they were still plentiful. So I, I, color me skeptical because the state record is uh, only a few pounds off that. Yeah, it's color what, me fourteen or fifteen very pounds, skeptical. right? 14 anyway. and change, I think, offhand. Yeah, yeah that's uh, that's not very likely, it seems yeah. to me, because the, the Missouri State record is, is less than 14. It's like 13, 14, came in 1961. Um, I am not so sure about 10-pounders being plentiful ever in the show. <laughs> All right, well, well, we'll figure that out for another episode. Anyway, so Zimmerly moves down to California. Uh, he has take, he's only been bash fishing five or seven years, something like that. And he's fishing from the shoreline at Miramar and decides that he wants to go rent a boat. So he goes and rents a boat uh, at about noon. He, he goes out, and an hour or so after being on the water, he sees this thrashing about the surface, goes over, and sees this big fish wallowing on the surface. He drops his anchor uh, and proceeds to watch this fish. And at this point, after he drops the anchor, the fish has gone from the surface and it is suspended about three or four feet below the, the, the surface. Now, again, you can read a, a beer can in 35, 40 foot of water at this lake. And being three or four or five feet down, you can see everything that's going on. And he not drops. Not too much, doctor. Not he, too much. He drops a night crawler down in front of its face, sees it goes in the mouth, hooks the fish on 10 pound line in a Zebco 303 or a Zebco 33 reel. 33. Um, the real. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm saying too much. Anyway, he gets the fish in the boat. Uh, proceeds to go to the to the dock, weighs the fish on the dock, and it weighs twenty pounds. Well, actually, they thought it weighed they thought it weighed uh, ten pounds, fifteen ounces. Did not real realize that the dial had gone around twice, so it ended up weighing twenty pounds, fifteen. Uh, that's when uh, lake officials get get called down to the dock, uh, and the mayhem started. It's the first 20 pounder in 41 years. Yeah. It's a pretty big deal. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing. And, and the interesting thing about that fish is, is were its dimensions. It was 27 or 26 and three quarter inches long and 28 inches in girth. It was. So it was. It, bigger around than it was long. And, and and one of the funniest newspaper clippings that I saw uh, was the, the title was It Was a Basketball with Eyes. <laughs> and that, <laughs> and, and, you know, we're going to have the picture up here. Uh, you, you take a look at the fish. If you've never seen this picture before, you'll fully agree with that description. A basketball with eyes. <laughs> Amazing fish. An episode for a later date. Dave Zimmerly's 2015 out of California's Lake Miramar in 1973. We'll do that one later, folks. Please hang around for that one. But, uh, Terry, um, uh, awesome show. Awesome revelations about California. And I, I, I come to the end of this story and I'm thinking, you know, yeah, I, I'm kind of, I got to admit, I'm kind of torn. Because um, the uh, the naturalist in me, the guy who wants things to be natural and ordinary and in the ordinary course of, of our biology, says, you know, it's kind of terrible that these fish were transplanted and put in, in alien waters and stuff like that. Alien. But the, they're the illegal hard... aliens. <laughs> well, oh, we're not California. Allowed to, we're not allowed they're, to say that They're illegal anymore. aliens. <laughs> no, I can, I can say it. I can say anything. I have dispensation <laughs> because I have no social media. I can't be canceled. Um, <laughs> But, but then there's then there's the bass fisherman in me that says, "How cool that we saw this assault upon the world record 
that lasted really from 1973 uh, into the into the mid 2000s and uh, and beyond. Because then in 2009 we saw the record tide eclipse, whatever you want to say, in Japan with alien fish, enemy fish from Florida again. So uh, I'm, I'm torn. Planet in 1925. But, yeah, I, I'm torn, but ultimately. Sign me up for some of this uh, bucket and barrel biology back then because I, I really – I love the stories that came out of it. Yeah, and, and you know, when we have Jim Brown on, uh, you know, I, I, I hope we can get him to go into into this. I mean, it, it, to hear it from the horse's mouth or once removed from the horse's mouth, let's say, that would be, that'll be really cool. Um, but, I mean, it just it, – it's an amazing story. I mean, they – it was a stupid discussion on a lake. Three buddies fishing on Lake Henshaw one day in 1959 that that changed the world of bass fishing forever. I mean, it was amazing success story. You know, we don't we don't have that many these days, right? You know, I mean, no, we li we live in a, a world that's afraid to take those kind of chances. I'm, I, I believe, right? Yep. So. So I, I, I do have it from you that you uh, you you approve of this. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anything that gives us more and bigger bass, ultimately sign me up. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, I think that's a wrap for uh, this episode of Big Bass Podcast. I'm Terry Batiste, and uh, on behalf of Ken Duke our, and our producer Nathan Benson, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, we sincerely hope that you'll uh, enjoyed the program, and if you did, you know, please give us a like, uh, share, let other people know that we're that we're out here uh, doing this. Uh, give us a thumbs up, you know, comment, yeah, please comment, you know, below, uh, and 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 let us know how we're doing. And if there's a story that that you want to hear us, you know, take a deep dive into, please let us know. Uh, anything that you can do to, you know, help us spread the word that, that we're out here, you know, talking about the history of big fish, uh, we appreciate it all. Um, again, our email addresses are below, but if you're listening to this, uh, Ken's email address is ken at thebigbasspodcast.com. Nathan's is nathan at thebigbasspodcast.com. And mine is Terry at thebigbasspodcast.com. Uh, and come back next week and we'll have a new show about another big bass, and including information that uh, you can't find anywhere else. So thanks for joining us. See you next week. <laughs>